group, respect community, et cetera. Yeah, so I can uh, speak to the staff side and then it would be helpful to hear from Linda. Uh, I'm sure for the rest of the subcommittee to hear about what's going on from the family side um, and community side. Um, so from the staff side, I can tell you what's been done and what we're looking forward to. And then a little bit about uh, just feedback that I had gotten from a call with the BEU earlier today. So last week, special ed staff had been collecting resources um, and materials, culling um, resources and materials in preparing and some have been sending along to families uh, for their students to engage in. Um, this week, taking the lead of uh, general education's uh, learning plans, special ed staff, um, including related service providers are creating learning support plans. So taking what general education has accommodating and modifying as necessary and then beginning to schedule in special education services which can include um, anything from consultation with families to uh, direct service be it individually or in small groups um, it's happening in pockets um, but again the scheduling piece is important because uh, availability capacity for both staff and families and students varies and could change from week to week. And so just getting a good sense of that before really scheduling it in uh, for folks for next week for the schedules to really, uh, schedules and support plans to be uh, fully implemented. Um, the feedback that we're getting from the BEU is um, staff are overwhelmed. Um, it's a lot to do as you can imagine uh, for students who get um, individually tailored education plans with varying degrees and different learning profiles. And what they have asked for is um, direction from me on what to prioritize. When you think about a special educator's role, there are sort of four elements to their roles when school is fully operational. One is consulting with all the adults uh, who have a hand in the student's life from um, general educator to service provider, uh, to parents. Another piece is direct instruction. What does that look like? Um, that could be service, um, that could be pre recorded materials, that varies. The other piece is designing materials. Um, that's another element. And then the fourth piece, uh, which is really only relevant for now, is the training piece. Uh, folks are new to all the different platforms and modules and and communicating. Um, and so I plan to taking this advice from BEU, what I'm hearing from um, uh, um, staff themselves is to streamline it a bit and to help them prioritize. I've had families reach out to me. Linda and Faith have also been sharing with me the perspective of uh, a parent with a student with special needs um, at home. I do want to add because this is um, OSS also is that for our students who have uh, are in out of district placements, our out of district coordinator, Kristen Beaupre, um, has logged what all of the schools are providing themselves virtually to their students, um, which has been great because they've started to deliver services, both academic and related service, depending on the school and, of course, the, the population that the school serves. Our next step now is to identify what it is that families and students need that these schools aren't getting. What are those gaps and can we fill that using PSB resources? An example would be Chromebooks. Um, we are identifying a list of students and there aren't that many, but there are a few who can't um, easily access the out of district resources um, because they have to share a computer. And so we're getting that list and uh, the out of district coordinator is working to uh, collect the names, get the Chromebooks um, and deliver them herself. Uh, lastly, from the uh, guidance and counselor guidance and counselors piece, they have identified a list of students who are considered um, high needs and high risk. Um, that list uh, from K to 12 has been developed and now they're working on refining that list. Uh, because there are these students are on there are some students on the list where parents have been responsive, which is really great. We've been in contact with parents, but not been able to reach the students. 
they've put those students on a different list and really now are folk and those students are they're still trying but now there's a list of students for whom we haven't been able to get a hold of them or their families so maria litas has been working on that um, another piece and linda I'll, I'll stop after this which i think linda can speak to is we're hearing from special educators that um, they are only reaching some of their students and not all of the students have been accessing the materials. I've been, I'm hearing from mostly related service providers and uh, I don't yet have a sense if it's because parents are focusing on the academics and when they can, they'll layer on the related service uh, materials and resources that are out there, but they're, they're responding more to the academics than the related services. Uh, Linda, Linda Monach is one of the people who is the head of CPAC and is the other one here, the other person? Yes, Faith is here. She's, yes. Okay. Yes. Here. She's just not on video. I couldn't think of her name. Yes, Faith is not on video, but the two of you are here. Um, what is your response to what is happening, Ben, and um, where do you think we need to go from here? Yeah, well, I just want to thank you guys for um, including us in this important work. We're really excited to be able to talk directly with you. We've been talking with Casey a lot and with various members of school committee between as people reach out to get information. So thanks for making us an official part of the team. Um, so I'm going to start and then Faith will chime in for everything that I miss, which will probably be quite a bit. Um, she's the brains in this group. So I just have a pretty backdrop. So. <laughs> That's all. Um, in terms of what family, we're hearing from families, um, we're hearing actually that a lot of people haven't been contacted by service providers. So it, it's interesting, just a little disconnect from what Casey's side is saying and what our side is saying. We're hearing that people aren't actually hearing from service providers that much. And when they are hearing from service providers, the things they're being offered are um, not particularly appropriate for what their child needs. And so trying to get actually direct services and things more tailored to their children, that's been difficult. Um, I think particularly there's frustration in the speech area. Um, there's a feeling that speech language pathology could be done pretty effectively virtually, and that right now they're getting videos from SLPs and things like that and not getting real direct contact. Um, I think overall there's one of the big things that we are feeling is a lack of social connection for our children, which for our children, it's, for many of them, it's a difficult thing, social connection anyway. And we'd really love to have help. Um, and this is one thing uh, Faith and I were talking about that as we're talking, many people are asking, what are we doing? How are we activating paraprofessionals and how are para paraprofessionals um, in the system, because we know we're paying them, so um, that could we get them to do little social groups with three or four students that are in the, in a grade, in a sort of appropriate peer group. Um, I've been doing it myself with my daughter and a few of her friends in fourth grade because nobody else is doing it for me, so I'm just setting up Zoom meetings with her friends just to have them now, I have them do a trip to the zoo, the San Diego Zoo virtually, but mainly they just sit and chit chat, which is really, really important, that social connection. And our kids don't have, a lot of them don't have the skills to do it themselves. So that's that's a big um, thing that folks are missing. Faith, what else am I missing? There was another thing. Before, before Faith, uh, Linda, may I just ask a question to clarify something? When you're talking about the service providers, are they Brookline staff people or are they outside service providers? It's Brookline staff people. So it's uh, speech, occupational therapy, physical therapy. I think for a lot of our students, those are things that can be done virtually. Um, a lot of times the parent has to be involved as well, um, but it can be done and We've been really slow to get those services up for a number of reasons, but I think people are really starting to get frustrated with that right now. Thank you. Um, for a lot of our students, I think academics are harder actually than the other things. So, and a little less important. Um, 
not, not important. I'm sorry. That makes it sound wrong. I think that if you don't have the regulation, if you don't have the connectedness, it's really difficult to get your child at all interested in the academics. So it's not that it's less important. It's that the other has to come first. Um, and we're feeling like there's a lot of work on getting the general education kids that social connection and the um, academic, and there's not as much that's really targeting the special education kids who just have a harder time accessing the same programs that the gen ed kids are accessing. Thank you. Uh, uh, Kate, go ahead. Um, sorry, just one second. Can you hear me? Okay, so, so our biggest concern, that the biggest concern I've heard from families is the lack of access to equitable services and equitable, like e any educational opportunities that involve peers and involve um, working, like being involved with their peers or like not even the regular education peers, but there are special education peers. There have been no, very few meetups involving um, their special education peers. So like that whole cohort thing in equity is, is an issue for our kids. And I think, I think Linda covered a lot of everything else that we were concerned about. The, the para, you, using, utilizing paras has been um, a concern. Our, our kids have not access their paras, they have not seen or communicated with their paras or their special education teachers for the most part. Um, and those are things that are a huge void. And and we're looking at, the like, further in the future, if we're looking at September and our, our children have not accessed peers and peer relationships, then they're going to falter. They're, they're not going to have a sense of community anymore whatsoever. I think it's important. Faith was saying, as we're talking about social connections and social connections with peers are incredibly important for our children, just like they are for all children. But um, many children in special education make very, very special, strong contacts, connections with their paras and their teachers. And they are closer with their paras and teachers than gen ed kids are, especially the children in the substantially separate programs. And Going from seeing a paraprofessional every day and being with them most of the day, five days a week, to not seeing them for three weeks has been just socially really difficult for our children. Like they love their paraprofessionals. Their paraprofessionals are important parts of their life. So I think Faith brings up a really good point. It's not just the peer connection, but that social connection to the teachers and paraprofessionals who have been so important to them um, in day to day living. And then the other thing, and I know this is beyond the scope of what probably what we're talking about today, but there's just a lot of anxiety and concern about what's happening with ESY and what we what we're going to do because there's just going to be so much to get back to where we were before. So ESY is another big concern right now because we got to get this fixed and then go there, but it is going to come up very very soon. Yeah, it's certainly coming up. So first, the um, piece about paras and uh, facilitating some type of social um, connection with students as groups, I think, is a great idea. What my team and I have been talking about in terms of activating paras was more um, uh, in uh, small learning groups. So connecting with special educators, um, it's not an either or. I think it should be both. So the piece about ESY, what we've been thinking about is um, lengthening it this year because we know so many of our kids um, regress very easily when school is not in session is to expand it to seven or eight weeks. Um, we toyed around with the idea of full day ESY, which we don't think is as impactful as a longer term versus a longer day. Um, uh, I'm working with facilities to determine that because that's when facilities uses the time to fully clean buildings. Um, so there's a logistics piece. We're also looking, uh, we're, we're considering contracting with um, other schools, like specialized schools and programs perhaps, and having service be delivered through them instead of in our own buildings. 
um, contracting with independent consultants, you know, service providers to do that work. Also, uh, one thing that the school committee has been great about is asking, you know, what does special ed need now as part of like emergency funding, um, emergency response, uh, because we know that we're going to have to layer on services after this in one way or another. Yeah, I, that's great. I, I think I would also add, I've mentioned this to um, Susan in other conversations, but I will bring it up to the whole committee here that um, as we look forward to um, 2020, 2021, next school year, whatever we have in budget for guidance and school psychologists, I would double it. Um, I know we have budget problems, but we're across the board going to have mental health issues um, going into September. It is going to be very difficult for parents and children to enter a building with 800 plus students in it. Um, and to feel comfortable doing that and to deal with all the things that they're dealing with. And hopefully it won't hit too close to home, but it's all, it's out there. And mental health is going to be just an extraordinarily big issue, would be my guess, for next year. Um, any comments or questions, Helen? <laughs> I have a question. Thank you for all the work that you're doing and thank you. Helen? to and Yes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? You can hear me. Uh, you're in and out, Helen. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, well, yeah. let me try. And if it goes out, let me know. Raise your hand or something, Barbara. Um, Thank you for all the work that you're doing. I think, it, you know, it's really, it's hard. It's not easy. There's many different layers it, that go on top of special education in addition to just regular education. Uh, but the one thing that I'm sort of, I'm puzzled, I'm wondering about is um, the one-on-one -on -one paraprofessionals, are they checking in with their kids every day at least? No, they haven't gotten, um, instructions yet to do that. There's some question about how that would work and what they would check in on. Just to the, you know, what somebody was talking about, just to say, hi, how are you doing? You know, um, I'm thinking about you, I'm here, you know, it, it have to be anything real serious, but I think just a connection. Yeah. Because I think kids may feel like they've been abandoned. Here's the person who is with them all the time, and you know, and we are paying them uh, right now. So even if they made a phone call to the house, wouldn't necessarily have to be you know very complicated with you know all the WebEx, which a number of us have had problems with, and Zoom or whatever. You know, just a phone call. You know, yeah. A daily phone call. Check in. How are you doing? You know, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Tell me what you did. Mm -hmm. Thing. I mean, I think that's a minimum. Yep, I agree. Thank you. Anybody else uh, have comments or questions? Uh, Barbara, it's Suzanne. Yeah. Could you just uh, mention <laughs> the one piece I didn't hear anything about was uh, plans for IEP annual reviews and uh, three year re evals. Do you have any, any new information on that? So the ETFs all met today with the special ed directors to talk about how to prioritize IEP meetings. I think the last time we spoke, we talked about working through um, the processes before and after an IEP meeting. So processing all the paperwork. Um, we have uh, worked, we have identified how the clerks will work and process the paperwork, which is great. So today they're talking through, or they did talk about uh, what meetings will be prioritized. I believe the directors were going in with the plan of asking ETFs to prioritize um, those IEPs where there will be transitions. So beep to kindergarten, um, fifth to sixth grade, eighth grade to high school, um, and then also those IEPs where uh, it's being, where out of district placement is being considered. Uh, that takes a little bit more coordination because out of district schools are um, are closed, um, but they are some, I should say, are entertaining new applications um, and offering virtual tours. Um, but they're still everybody's working out those pieces. Uh, families should be 
uh, notified starting next week where they are with IEP meetings. Um, I think that's the first tier. So transition IEPs and uh, IEPs where placements are changing. And then next tier will be for students whose IEPs have expired who are due for annuals. Now, Desi has told us that those IEPs are still in effect despite them being uh, expired. So those services are still in effect. Yeah, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say revals are a little trickier because it depends on whether or not evaluation was evaluations were completed prior to closure. If they weren't completed prior to closure, uh, we'd have to wait until schools open to test kids uh, to have those meetings happen. I just wanted to add in that um, Casey has been keeping us posted on this IEP process and getting that together so I appreciate that we've been kept in the loop on that and I know parents are really eager for it but from our perspective the priority is getting services and getting kids connected first and IEPs kind of come secondly but the other thing I would add is that while I appreciate the triage approach there might also be a group of IEPs that are just really easy to just get done and you know that just need a few little changes that the meeting already happened and the IEP just didn't come out because it was caught in. And I would just encourage those to just get them off of everybody's plate and move them on. Um, so two different ways of triaging, sort of what are the most critical to do, but what are also the easy gets so that we can just have them done and move on. Jennifer, <clears throat> you've had your hand up. Um, yes, hi. Um, thanks for everybody for their work on this. Um, I may have missed this. I'm sorry, my, my mind is going very quickly as I'm listening to this. So I apologize if I'm asking a repeat. Um, do what is our plan for or or is do you or is there a plan to make a plan to sort of scoop up and make sure that everyone is getting contact with their service providers? So like I'm hearing some information where families are saying that they haven't been contacted by their special their special providers. Um, and, and, and the district's plan that people are reaching out. And so do we have a plan for making sure that all that connection has been made? I know we talked about kids who haven't been reached and kids who have not, but within the subset of special education in particular, do we, is there a plan to, to make sure that everyone's gotten some contact and that we've heard back? So, um. My understanding is that everyone has gotten some contact. It may be from the learning center teacher. Uh, it may be from speech, so uh, I wouldn't doubt it if there are students for whom all of the advisor, all of the adults uh, on the special education team um, have not contacted them. Um, to your question, Jennifer, about related service providers specifically, um, I am working with the BEU to better understand or, or to uh, uh, become aligned on expectations regarding communication with students. So just, just to make sure that I'm being, I hear you. Thank you very much. Um, like I, I'm thinking, I'm feeling like it's pretty reasonable and I understand that you're doing some work to sort of align this work that, um, you know, that it's the speech or uh, speech and language pathologist and a learning center teacher and you know, we could all be making those contacts, though, directly with students. So instead of just having one contact with the LC teacher, I mean, I would be expecting each service provider to be reaching out and making a plan to support the students um, during this time. So that that's sort of like what, what I'm thinking. It sounds like maybe we're not there yet, but I'm assuming that we will be. So they are working on a plan, but they are not all individually working on a plan with the parent. So this is what those learning support plans are that they're working with. And I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself in that, you know, th they're spending this week putting together that schedule, which is the support plan. So um, a learning center teacher knows the support that a student needs from an academic perspective. Speech is looking to see Monday to Friday, what day they will be connecting with students. OT is looking up. Oh, okay, it looks like for 20 minutes speech on Tuesdays is doing it. So on Thursday, I will connect with student then and then that all gets communicated to a parent starting next week. Um, so there's that plan um, where, you know, those three related those three providers are talking, but not all three are talking to 
every single family. Does that make sense? Yes, that it makes sense to know that there's a plan that will go out for Monday that of a sort of like a schedule of interface with providers and students. I'm just thinking that if they haven't, it might be helpful to just sort of like a hi, how are you? We're going to have a plan. I'll be following up with you soon so that there's just that contact. I mean, whether it's an email to families so that people know it's it's in the queue, like it's coming and I didn't forget about you and I've made contact. I just think that that might be helpful, um, you know, to, to reach out to caseloads that way it, until that plan is set saying like, we have a plan, it's just not ready yet. We're all coordinating, we'll be in touch, you know, by X date or whatever. And I think it's for some families, it's just the anticipation of that and the, un, the not knowing um, that feels like really in flux in the larger, context of everything that's going on i think it causes some anxiety so you've been just saying we're working on the plan we don't have it yet but it'll be out by then may be helpful for some for some families i mean i i've gotten a lot of contact as a parent i've gotten a lot of contact from service providers so um and that's been very helpful to sort of know what the plan is um and so i would you know be great if if all families had had that sort of consistency across schools or providers so um i appreciate that You're next Thank you, Barbara. I'm sorry, Casey, if you covered this, I had trouble getting on the meeting, but my question is, is the same one that I've asked for with respect to general education services is that when we're talking about this plan that will start for next week, are we talking about providing services or we're going back to this notion of self directed, uh, what do we call it? Yeah, self directed learning. And are we pushing resources and pushing things that the students you know, potentially could maybe do at home or could do with their parents if the parents are able to sit next to them and do the activities. Are we anticipating that if you had a small group that helped with um, literacy, for example, and that group had three people, that we would be trying to find a, a way to replicate that as best as we can within this new realm of digital learning and maybe the the teacher would do reading that the children would have with them or however that looks for the that group of students. Are we going to try to achieve that? So we are, um, what I have communicated to staff is to uh, begin service delivery next week. Mm -hmm. um, what parents should not expect though is for um, IEPs to re be replicated in the same way as if school is fully operational. And then is this coming with some guidance and expectation so that we have consistency of experience? So I know that that's not, we're not replicating exactly the services by any stretch that we would be able to do when the teacher is able to sit right next to the students and provide feedback in that way. But are we having um, kind of a, a unified training or, or unified thought about how this will be delivered so that if you receive speech services from Driscoll School or speech services from Lincoln School, that that looks similar? Or is this just up to each teacher to, to use Pinterest and you know Google to decide how it is that they're going to deliver speech services in this way and, and what that looks like for them? So that's the part that I've been, not just me, but the directors and I have been trying to wrap our heads around because um, our own staff members capacity and availability varies so much. Um, we have folks with three young kids at home full time. Uh, so it's harder for her to sit down and offer one to one or even, you know, small group live work. Um, and then also um, the group your population matters too so it's hard i i would love to be able to uh confirm a consistent uh model for service delivery among mm -hmm. all of the disciplines um i guess what i'm saying is i'm juggling or trying to balance a number of factors here uh both that are related to the pandemic um but also the different populations that our buildings have. Um, this is back to that sort of like set of expectations and guidelines that I'm working with the BEU to uh, push out to staff that I hope will speak to some of those expectations like frequency for communication with students and families, modes of delivery, 
Okay. Go ahead, Julie. Yeah, that's, I mean, I guess it is, I, I just really fear that we will, that there will be, based on whether you have a teacher who is available or whether you have a teacher who is not, or whether you have a teacher who's going to dig in all in, or you have a teacher who's not, for whatever and various reasons, that students will be having ter terribly different experiences and that for many of these students, how they receive those services impacts how they're able to receive everything else. Yeah. So if you're not having that reading support that you need, you're getting all this homework and you are feeling like you are underwater. And so, you know, how are we, and, and what other resources might we have? You know, we see this in the hospital models and in other industries now where they're reassigning and reallocating resources. And so, you know, you might have a, a school secretary who before was answering the phones and, and greeting visitors who are coming into the building. That's not happening now. And maybe now that person is checking in in a different way or being utilized in a different way. And I just wonder, you know, we have 8,000 employees or something. If there are not different allocations of responsibility that we could have and different resources that we can utilize so that as we have gaps, we can help fill those gaps. Um, yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that we discussed this morning was we have, uh, we're starting to see that inconsistent application of practice that can lead to some real inequities. Um, and so I am rethinking the idea of how folks are providing service, uh, which may involve, I mean, I, it's still very new to me right now in my thoughts, so I don't want to go too far down that road, but it would require folks potentially to share uh, people with job alike, so all of the SLPs potentially working together and saying, you are the K-2 SLPs for the district. And how do you connect with kids? You are three to five SLPs or OTs, um, but that comes with a huge shift mindset, cultural resources. Uh, there might be some confidentiality issues here, but I don't think it's insurmountable, but just requires a little, a lot of my time and director's time to really think through this possibility. But all the things you're bringing up, Julie, um, are exactly the things that are happening like by the hour as we sort of uncover more and more of what's possible and what's not possible and having to pivot as we answer those questions. <clears throat> Helen, go ahead. Just a quick question. First of all, I think the creativity part is what we're going to really have to to think about. You know, how do we look at things to, outside the box, you know, so to speak. And and just like you're saying, I think that's a great idea. You you think of yourself as teams, and and how do you divide the work so that everybody can can do it? Um, one question though that I had. You know, a lot of this sort of depends. I assume the communicating with families has been through email. And I worry that there are families who don't communicate through email or that may not read their emails. And maybe we need to pick up a phone occasionally to get them involved. So then they will do that second part. I'm assuming at this point, either everybody has that everybody has access to email. Uh, so folks have been reaching out. They know who the families are who don't use email, and so they have been picking up the phone. That's fantastic. Thank you. That's good. <clears throat> Any other quick questions, Sharon? Go ahead. So I just I have I have like a little bit of concern about sort of the 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 process by which inputs are being factored into how it is that we're prioritizing what needs to happen with service delivery for kids with special needs. Like, it sounds to me like, and, and please correct me if I'm understanding this wrong, like on the back end, you're having discussions with the BEU and with your team, and that is feeding into individualized learning plans prior to having consultations, consultations with families. And then when you do have consultations with families, the priority is going to be on managing family expectations, right? The concern that I have is that that doesn't seem like a very child-centered approach trying to kind of figure out what it is that kids need, what it is that, they, that families need, and how it is that we can provide it to them. And while I, I certainly like think that it's really important for us to be working closely with the BEU, 
around making sure that the teachers have everything that they need to do in order to do their job. I have concerns about the extent to which DEU priorities are factoring into how it is that we're going about setting, um, you know, like actual plans or the process for the development of actual plans for actual children receiving special education service delivery. Um, because I can tell you on my end, like, I hear what you're saying about the need for um, having a certain kind of, not, not uh, the, the kind of minimum standards, right? Like, or a set of, you know, sort of minimum expectations and trying to, to sort of universalize those. But what I'm finding is that that minimum standard is both poorly adapted to the needs of the children with special needs that they're being targeted to. And they're also, um, they're also below what a lot of service providers feel like they can be providing, right? Or even want to provide, you know? And so, um, you know, I, I, I think that we have to kind of take a big step back and I think, and I want to echo some of my colleagues here and sort of like kind of reflect on the experience of quite a few of our neighboring districts who are making it a standard practice to call families regularly on a, on a recurring basis and check in with them and make sure that the needs of the kid are at the center of how it is that we're, you know, going about and implementing plans for the kid. I've received I'm just sorry to say this, but I think that this is something that's going to map onto our next discussion too. I received several phone calls today from um, educators who are concerned because they're being advised at the schoolhouse level to do less than what it is that they want to do for their students in the name of equity. And I think that that's a really unfortunate application of the concept of equity. I mean, that is a, a very strict interpretation of the concept of equality, right? But equity means, you know, trying to deliver to students the best that we can possibly deliver in line with whatever it is that they can actually, what, in line with whatever it is that they need. Um, and, and, and I'm concerned that the process that we're moving, that we've been moving forward, that we've been moving towards over the course of these last three weeks and into next week, you know, isn't putting children at the center. So um, I, I, I'm just gonna put that concern on the table. I don't really feel like I need a response, but um, it's, it's, a, it's a serious set of concerns and, it, and I think it, it has implications for everything that, it is, that we're gonna do moving forward. Well, thank you very much. Um, we, you, I know Linda and Faith have other things that they might like to do, um, but we really appreciate your coming here. And um, if we can manage it, we have our next curriculum subcommittee meeting is in early May, and maybe we can do another checkup um, with the special ed program and how things are going and, and whatever. So thank you, those of you who have come to talk about this. You're welcome to stay or you're welcome to go, whatever, whatever, is, uh, whatever you choose. So thank you. Um, for the rest of us, uh, we need to talk a bit about the um, um, committee that we discussed last night and what our expectations are for that committee to do. We have received today a very detailed um, description of what's being happened, what is happening now, the, the PSB long-term remote learning guidance from, from Ben and Nicole and uh, the staff. And um, what I think we were talking about doing was looking at what the expectations are for students, what, what do we need to expect for students at various grade levels, uh, what they will have accomplished by the um, end of the year. So I think I'd like to open that discussion, not, not about expectations, but about the, the committee and what the committee expects to be doing and uh, go from there. People who have ideas, questions, et cetera. Helen. Well, I very quickly Read, and I, I can't say I know it in depth, both uh, pieces, both from Ben and the staff and from Sharon. And it seems like there's some overlap 
there. I, I guess I would want the committee before they start to reinvent the wheel, the task force to look carefully at that and and figure out what are the areas that need to be expanded on or worked on um, rather than you know, saying, well, there's nothing out there and we're just going to start here. So that would be just my suggestion. And I must say, I read it very quickly. I read them quickly as well. Um, I, I the, the, what I would say is, there is, we, we certainly need a task force to do this. There, the school committee is dealing with the values that we expect. Um, and the big picture. We are not dealing with the nitty gritty of everyday learning, and we are not even dealing with the content of everyday learning. That is up to the uh, staff. We only approve um, at a higher level. So I, part of me wonders what is appropriate for us to do here as, um, school committee committee. I mean, Are you so talking about the task force? I'm it's talking perfect. about the task force because uh -huh. in, in uh, Sharon's plan, it, you know, do this by this, do this by this, do this by this, do this by this, as if we are directing the administration about how to do their job on a day-to-day -day basis, which I don't believe is our role. I think that our role deals with a higher level of what our expectations are. And I see there. I'm not saying it can't be modified, but that's that's what I was what I what my feeling was. Julie. I did think thank you, Sharon, for putting down thoughts on paper. I think it's always helpful to have, you know, a a place to start conversation from. And so, you know, I think one of the important things to think about is when we're talking about the task force, who are, what Barbara's saying is, who are the members of the task force and kind of what is the core purpose of it? And I think that it's, there were two other groups of individuals who I was wanted to mention and see what people's thoughts are on participating. And I think my concern about the group that Sharon had outlined with two to three school committee members, two to three educators, two school level administrators, and one PSB administrator, is that it seems to lack um, input from curriculum coordinators and, uh, and some of the individuals who have really been spending a lot of time thinking about these things over the last couple of weeks and starting to set plans in motion. And so, it almost seems like two separate processes where you would have the work of the, you know, the task force working over here and then curriculum coordinators and our st leadership staff working over here. And I just wonder if there's not, if it's not better. No, sweetie. I'm wondering if it's not better to have one group that's all working together and having more of the school committee as a liaison, you know, as part of this conversation as a liaison, um, but leaving the core work of what is happening to curriculum coordinators and to principals and having educator input as well. So that's my first comment. And then the second is whether it makes sense to have parents participate in this in the in the group as well. And so those are my, the two comments I wanted to make. So Julie, along those lines, I also agree with you that uh, parents should be considered for inclusion uh, in this task on this task force. Frankly, I think they should be included because a lot of the input we are receiving uh, is coming from parents. The parents themselves are somewhat divided, although I think it's fair to say that most want to see a more robust online education program of some kind. The details of what that would entail might differ. But I think there's a general consensus that there needs to be structure and that there needs to be consistency. And probably the best way to ensure at a minimum that we have strong communication is to have a parent's voice directly on the task force 
uh, and perhaps more than one parent, I would think at least two, because there are some differences uh, in the among parents as to how we should best proceed. Uh, I think that would create a little more balance if we have school committee members, if we have administrators, uh, as well as parents. In addition, I also echo uh, Julie's sentiments around having a curriculum coordinator or two involved, as that's a vital piece to all this. Curriculum coordinators would obviously have the most experience in rolling out curriculums, uh, whereas educators, uh, in terms of the teachers, are involved more in the implementation and carrying out of the curriculum, but the coordinator creates it. So I think we need to have a balance of all those constituencies. But my problem goes beyond that. I think that the work of creating what is going to happen is belongs in the hands of the, the administration and the staff. We don't, as school committee, have a great deal of say over what is done and how it is done. We set the guidelines, the values. We talked last night at the meeting about thinking about what we wanted the outcomes for students to be at the end of the year. Where did we hope that they would be? What do we hope that they had learned? Not doing the work of setting up how it's done. Barbara, if it's any help, I think that another way of looking at school committee's role is from a general oversight perspective so that we are aware of what's going on so that we can be effective communicators so that there is not uh, ignorance on our part. I wouldn't say it's intentional, but if we are involved on a more uh, practical day-to-day -day level for the rollout of what this program will be, then we're in a better position to evaluate, to judge, to communicate. And those are important roles. So I don't view this as us directing the administrators directly uh, in what to do. We're not dictators. It's more um, understanding what's taking place, providing input and guidance as requested. Very often in our meetings, our opinions are sought, even if uh, statutorily our opinions are not uh, required. So I, I see value there. As long as you're talking about oversight, I would agree with you. We can we can exhibit a certain amount of over oversight, but it is really in the hands of Ben and Nicole and company to know what they're doing as long as it meets the values that we have set up. Yes. So this is Susan, you know, two thoughts. One is that the school committee is responsible for the learning expectations um, within which curriculum and um, other initiatives are, um, are introduced and, and flower. Um, I think one thing that's become increasingly clear to me is that we have on a kind of on a, on a good day, on a regular day, we have um, more or less understanding about what those are, meaning we have the state framework, state standards. We have our own learning expectations that we passed quite a while ago, some of which are pretty out of date. Um, we have a lot of work that's happened through Nicole's office on the essential curriculum discussion over the last year and a half, the portrait of a graduate and some of the pieces of, you know, what, what do we think is something that should be provided consistently across all the different um, grade levels and subject areas. Um, and we obviously have, you know, curriculum coordinators who are sort of looking at, you know, grade level teams and and all sorts of, I mean, there's, there's a lot of work going on. And so I think the good news is we don't have to start with a blank slate, but I do think that in this time, Having a what it, it's patently clear to me that we don't have agreed learning expectations for the rest of the school year. And some people, in all honesty, want it to be exactly the way it was um, or would have been if we were in school. I think it's a very small group, but I think they exist. And I think to them, we need to clearly continue to message as we have that that's not realistic. And 
that's not anything I would assume anyone on this call supports. Um, I don't support it. I, I think we've had enough conversations about that. It's just not going to be the same. Um, I think when it was two weeks, um, really having a lot of individual um, initiative was great and important and trying to just figure out how to use Zoom or Google Meets or, you know, just just trying to figure out how to get a bunch of second graders to mute their Google Meets microphone so that it wasn't chaos so that, you know, a teacher could read a book. Um, that said, I think there's a lot of room in the middle. And I think that because we haven't, because parents don't have a clear sense of what to expect, they are like kind of rail to rail. They're kind of all over the place in terms of what they want and what they think they're getting. And so I, it does seem to me that if our role is to um, create the learning expectations, you know, it, within which, which is kind of like the overall guidance of what should a second grader know in English by the end of the year, what should a third grader know in social studies by the end of the year, um, you know, a bunch of those things aren't going to be relevant right now. Um, but as you know, I think Suzanne, you said this last night or someone did, you know, we already have a lot of that. So it, it seems to me a shame to start with something new. It seems to me that we have to take what we have and understand what it is that we think can reasonably deliver it in this time period and what it will take to do that, both in terms of technology, in terms of teachers, in terms of, you know, teaming, there's all kinds of things that need to go into it. Um, and I and I just worry that if we don't do this, not only will we have continued sort of unrest um, in large, large segments of the parent population, but we're also, as I had mentioned last night, I think we're sort of at significant risk of coming back in September with kids having wildly, wildly different experiences over this time. And that's not good for anyone. Um, it, of course, there will be some differences. I don't want to say that there won't be. Of course, there will. But um, especially for our more vulnerable populations who may quite frankly need more in this time period than other children might need. Um, I think we would just, we're, we're not meeting our obligation if, if we don't create that sort of clarity. So it seems to me that we have a lot of raw materials to work with. I, I assume things are happening um, among the curriculum coordinators and principals. I don't assume they're not happening. But I think what's what's clear is that pulling that together in a timely way and in a way that is going to make sense to um, a lot of people who feel like they are not getting what they need, um, I think is a really important function of this of this school committee. So it's not that I mean, in an ideal world, this task force would have three meetings, one to outline what it is that we think we need, a second one to sort of check in on things, and the third one to you know, get some communications out to parents. I think that that assumes that all of the things that I mentioned are underway or in good shape or completed um, without the need for a task force. And I think I think part of what's happening is that I, I assume a lot of good work is happening, but the communication on it isn't happening. And I don't think it's happening with consistency. And I worry a lot that that it's not happening in a way that at any rate, that matches to a set of learning expectations that we as the school committee share, because I don't think we've had those conversations. So it seems to me that an important first task is to do some assessment of sort of where we are on a, on a number of different dimensions, um, which I don't think is clear yet. It might be clear to a, some individuals, but I don't think it's sort of generally clear. Um, I think it's to understand and get some agreement on what we can, what do we think is a reasonable set of you know things to get done by the end of this year and try to understand what it is that our educators and our parents need to be able to do that. Um, so for me, um, again, it could be a pretty short exercise. Um, it might take a lot longer um, to the extent that there isn't agreement on those things. So I do agree that there should be, you know, a principal or two, a coordinator or two. I think we need representation from um, parents who are involved in special education. I think we need representation from Steps to Success um, or in some of our other communities that might need more um, might need more uh, services than others. Um, I think we probably need somebody like Mindy, who um, I would hope and assume we haven't even talked about um, English learners um, and what they're getting, what they need, how this is working for them. Um, but it, it does feel to me like there's there's a fair amount that that has to get get communicated and and specifically people want to know. What is my child going to 
you know, what's, what's going to happen over the next three months with my kids. So I, I don't think it's a different set of questions from what we've been saying for the last three weeks. I just think we're still asking them. And, and that's the kind of thing that I would hope. I, for sure, I don't think anyone has time to do people's jobs for them. Um, I don't. I have enough jobs. Um, but I think making sure that it's communicated out in a way and with a clarity and with a, at least some consistency, I think is important. I would also like to see we've had a number of people um, from the, the, you know, within the BEU who have been, you know, good and important partners. I would hope that we would have someone from the BEU who's willing to to join us as well. Um, so those are just some starting thoughts. I'm happy to articulate any of them more, but but that, those are some starting thoughts um, for reaction. And I'm not 100% sold on anything I just said, so um, I'm I'm open to to dialogue. So I'm not sure if Nicole is on. Um, she had to step away for a moment. Uh, Susan, I uh, I think I know in talking to Nicole earlier today, we agree with much much of what you said there. Um, and what I heard was, you know, we need to continue this work, do it rapidly, report back quickly to folks, get more guidance from the, from this task force, adjust, uh, get get this out. But what the focus is is Clear learning expectations, clear uh, goals of what people, what students will be learning and accomplishing by the end of the year. Um, you know, uh, and do that so it's coordinated by grade level. Um, make sure parents are clear on what to expect from our staff on a day to day or week to week or, or in three month period. Um, and do that really quickly. And um, you know that works underway. It needs to accelerate. It needs to. Uh, we have not been uh, defining that on a great level or on a um, uh, yeah or on a subject area level. Um, and so that's work that has to be done. And I think can be done very quickly. Honestly, you know our educators know what they work towards every year, what their goals are, what their expectations are. They still know those. But if we Want to do it so it's district wide. Um, uh, I think we can do it relatively. relatively we can do that quickly. Um, yeah, I, and I just want to emphasize that I have. I am uh, oddly enough, I'm enormously optimistic about this. I actually think that this could be fantastic. I have been on, and I will just tell a story without naming names, but um, I guess you could figure it out pretty easily. But I was on a Google Meet this morning with my son's second grade class. And there were about a dozen of them. And the first one was clearly a goat rodeo. Everybody was talking, the kids were moving in and out of the screen, the, no one had their mute button on. I mean, it was a disaster. They were all eight years old. And the teacher was fantastic. She was you know, trying to get them to do their thing. The second meeting, everyone had their mute button on. This is eight, eight year olds. There was a parent somewhere off screen. They were watching the screen. They were staying in their frame. They were answering questions. They were they were engaging. It was about baking. It was about Legos. It was about um, guitar. It was about all kinds of Dungeons and Dragons came up. I mean, there was so much engagement and excitement and interest that that you might say, oh, well, an eight year old can't possibly do X. And they really did. They really could. Now, not every child was on it. And again, I worry about the kids with who don't have access to that from a special needs perspective or from a technology perspective or from a language perspective, but those are solvable problems. And those are things that affect a, a, an important percentage, but not the majority. And that's why I feel like if we could identify some of these things that we could then focus in on the kids who don't have the kind of access that two thirds of the class, or I don't know what the percentage would be, has, and therefore, we can focus our time and resources more intentionally, and the educators can do so as well. So that when they say, well, you know, we're going to come up with a passion project, everybody gets, and Barbara, I was thinking of you, you would have been so delighted. It was everybody comes up with a passion project, and one eight year old picked penguins, and they have like found, they went on Google Images with their, you know, and, and found all these different pictures of penguins. They were so excited, they learned all about penguins. So do I think that every eight year old needs to know about penguins? No, but do I think that every eight year old should be able to pick a project, figure out some images, do some writing, present to their peers? Like there's a set of, of educational experiences that our kids can have 
um, that that are not a set of standards that we can have that are not worksheets, but it's okay, every kid can do a like mini research project, you know, in, in, in quotation marks where they can look for put, you know, put together a story. So what I'm looking for in terms of learning expectations is truly learning expectations, which is what we what we have, not a standard curriculum, not a standard set of worksheets, but a set of expectations about what we want our and again, I think K-5 is different from 6-8, which is different from high school because they're just in really different, like the educators are in different places, the kids are in different places. So that's why I do think that by, by grade span and by subject really matters. Um, and I think that being able to supplement that with real support for kids who are not in households that can support it or whose own challenges can't support it, we can target our resources and, and maybe over invest in them so that they they can have they, they will get more they will get more time they will get more resources as it should be so at any rate i'm um enormously optimistic <laughs> i guess i just want to I, I want to leave it there so i would like to i would like to say like so i hear what everybody's saying and i appreciate the focus on learning expectations but i also think that the purpose of the task force needs to be a little bit broader than that um i'm not saying that listen like i have my own job and so does everybody else here as well as three children to educate at home um, I am not interested in replicating the work of the of the of the fifth floor. Um, I do want to say that there are some some basic coordination issues that remain problematic, right? Um, and some basic guidance issues that are not um, that are not being clearly uh, that are not being clearly not just like communicated, but just sort of defined, right? And I think that there's some basic definitional issues that need to be defined. So first of all. Is our expectation that children in K through two are going to be interacting via the internet, you know, using Google Meet? Well, then perhaps it's time that we ensure that every student in K through two receive a PSBMA account. Because as of now, students in K through two do not have PSBMA accounts, which makes it impossible for teachers to share information with them through Google Classroom. So teachers, so kindergarten teachers, first grade teachers, and second grade teachers are piecing together different kinds of communication, largely through email, where they're posting things to clouds, and they're posting some things to classrooms, and they're trying to get meet notices out, like with a, you know, with a five minute bandwidth right before the start of the meeting, right? Because kids do not have access to PSBMA accounts, right? Like this is a fixable thing, right? Um, another thing that I, you know, that I think that we need to kind of manage, and I think that this touches on another role that the school committee plays in terms of its negotiations with DEU is sort of like, what are reasonable expectations for educators right now? Um, and I have to say, like, I have reviewed the PSB long-term remote guidance. I think that some of it is really salutary. And I think it's, some of it is really confusing and is sending very mixed messages. So for example, the team collaboration structure that's been advised. You explain why a team is good, you explain why a team is helpful, um, and you say you should be working as a team. But what I'm hearing in terms of the implement at the implementation level is that um, is that even though we've written into our MOU that we are expecting a baseline commitment of 20 hours per week, but the teachers can work all the way up to full time and provide whatever resources they feel like are appropriate, teachers are being pressured by administrators and by other teachers to cut back the amount of their contributions so that they are the same as sort of like the you know, least common denominator based on people, based on individuals' available resources. I don't think that that's an appropriate service to deliver to our children. I don't think that that's an appropriate way to be respectful to you know, professionals who kind of want to put more on the table. I think that we need to be creating an environment in which teachers can excel in this format if they choose to do so. And so I have concerns about that guidance. Um, I have concerns, for example, around the clarity around introducing new learning content. I don't understand what the language means. Consider introducing new content or information while using previously taught skills. I mean, I think that like we need to decide as a school committee or as a task force or whatever, are we gonna like it, it's time to like make a decision. Like, are we gonna teach kids new stuff or are we just not over the next three months? And like that needs to be decided. Because it seems like we're receiving guidelines from Desi and the governor that's basically saying, yeah, you should be teaching children, you know, um, and not this sort of consider whether or not you want to do it. Um, 
And so, and I also think that, you know, to, to sort of touch back on the conversation that we were having with CPAC, I mean, I think that there continues to be some standing questions about like, you know, how whatever it is that we're providing aligns with the experience. Like whatever our current definition of contact is, is, um, you know, for some people, like it's for some students, it's a 40 minute check-in every, like, you know, or morning meeting every single day. For other students, it's a once a week email, right? To an entire group of people, right? Like, and that is, you know, um, and like when you kind of like compound that out, I mean, it's like the, the level of disparity here is really, really, really broad. And the goal, our goal is not equality of experience strictly. Our goal is equality of experience in the service of delivering the best possible education and the highest quality education that we possibly can. And I really think that we need to be thinking about the quality of the educational product that we're delivering. Um, and so that was what was informing me. Now, I, when, I, when I sort of laid this sort of thing out, these are some of the sort of key areas that like, um, I, these are some of the key actions that I think that we can take in order to rapidly identify gaps across our implementation that are already being reported to us may not be the most appropriate model for this, but like that's where I'm coming from. We've got big, big gaps right now between what we, between what the administration thinks is happening and what people are experiencing. And we need to close that gap substantially and very quickly. I agree that there are gaps between uh, what folks are doing. Folks are doing things differently across the district. That is um, a, a particular challenge right now and obvious to everybody. It's consistent with what happens uh, in the district uh, every day. Um, you know, a wise person once told me not to swing at every pitch, but there are a couple of pitches I've got to swing at here, Sharon. You uh, continue to cherry pick the document. Um, it, it, and I think if people read the guidance that went to staff, interesting new learner content, it says very clearly, it is expected that staff will introduce new content as the approach continues. It's unequivocal, okay? What you are reading, was not the whole tent was not the whole sentence, which was consider introducing new content or information while using previously taught skills. The idea that new content comes with previously taught skills. That it will, so that that's helpful to students. The other thing I'm really concerned, you said this last night and also tonight, is you're claiming that first you said teachers, now you're saying teachers and administrators are pressuring other teachers to do less. That's a pretty serious indictment of our staff and our in our and our mentors. And I simply don't buy it. I'm, I'm happy to do, pick up with that response. Like it was a focus on what the task force will accomplish and for the school committee to figure out the guidelines of it, what the charge of it, what the goal of it. And so far we've heard, which I, which Nicole is already on and has been for a couple of years, or at least a couple of years, is identifying some essential standards and, and, and common goals that grade level teams will accomplish uh, by the end of this year. We are all for that. We're, that's beginning to get under, that's getting underway. It would be helpful to know what other things the, the committee wants the task force to oversee or accomplish or make sure it gets done. So I will um, to that list or bring back up because I think it's been said already. I'm not sure that I have a whole lot that hasn't been said. Um, consistency and communication, I think, are the two big things that the task force can really help with. Um, and that's part of, for me, the part of the oversight is the, can, is helping to bring together and, and reduce the, it, the significant inconsistencies that we're hearing about. Um, you know, there, there may be expectations um, from administration and, and maybe the rollout just looks different from, from many, many different reasons. Um, and we just need to figure out what those are and how do we balance that and how do we support each other? Um, that, I think that's a great value in job alike teams and grade level teams um, to support each other in that work and to help with consistency. Um, and then the communication, I think that there's just been, um, there just hasn't been as much communication or the kind of communication that, that families are looking for. And so I think that the task force could, could potentially help with some of those issues. I also wonder if it's not, if the task force couldn't be utilized to help provide a mechanism for input and feedback from the community. I think that we're hearing a lot of, um, that we're hearing a lot of frustration and I think a lot of parents feel like there's not a way for, um, to be heard. And I, 
fully agree and and I fully agree full stop that the teacher is the first point of contact so if you have an issue or something coming up then the first place to go is to the teacher but I think that there are some kind of maybe broader sorry we're having a lot of play happening here um that in the broader you know in this moment that there if there was another place for people to get questions answered that that could help bring the level of anxiety down and and I think it's a little sometimes it's a little a lot to ask the teachers to be fielding the sort of questions that that are coming and then they don't know the answers to some of the things that are being asked and so I think I wonder if the task force couldn't set up the survey set up an FAQ help with some of those sorts of things um, and that that would be could be useful to the to the district and then the, the other way I was wondering is with this collaboration amongst teachers and I just I was wondering we received a fabulous communication at the beginning of this week from our fourth grade teacher and in it she had her literacy the block there's a book and when you click on it there's a chapter for every book that you can now access online and just thinking about how much how many different Mackenzie, honey, can you be quiet for one sec? How many different sorts of skills and resources that teachers are having to tap into? And I was just wondering, Ben or Nicole, if you could give a little bit of insight into what re what resources we're able to push out to say, or if there are um, like shared uh, databases or something where it's like, if I'm a fourth grade teacher and I'm looking for a book that you can get online that's broken up by chapter, that's free or cheap or whatever it is, um, or that the district can pay for, here's where you go. So that each teacher isn't individually having to do those sorts of things. And so my question is whether that already is in place. And if it's not, if that's something that perhaps the task force couldn't help in some way with. Are you there? Um, so as far as like some of the classroom resources that teachers use, they're the best um, um, people to, to kind of, this is part of why the, the coordinators can lead the work, but the, the detail of it is what, where we need teacher feedback, right? And so um, there are resources that were provided at the very beginning of this where families can access information, that same um, information has been shared with teachers. Do teachers, like, because of their work and their hands-on work with classrooms, do they have more information than coordinators? Probably they do. So I, that much I know, you know, we can talk about big programs, News LA, News ELA and, um, different programs like that that really go along with the curriculum that we have access to but as far as the the different um technologies that teachers might have come across i would say that the best place to get that is from teachers i guess so so my thank you nicole my and my question and my second layer of that question is then so if i'm a teacher and i have found this great resource or this yeah. Or how do how do I then share that easily and quickly with other teachers so that everyone is not having to self so that, so that thinking about our teachers and how isolating they must feel not having the same sorts of collaborations that they were having before. So what ways can we help them to collaborate that doesn't involve 99 meetings or emails? I mean, is there so, right? So one of the things that I I know just in my conversations with one of the K teachers is that um, they, so first of all, let me back up and say that our teachers are probably collaborating more now than they ever have because they have the time to do it. We don't have the structure in the day for them to collaborate as much as they're collaborating now. Um, one of the things that the kindergarten team is doing across the district is they are they have a google folder they're all uploading their resources to one folder and they're sharing them and they know this is where i can get resources so that's what we're trying to get to happen at all um, grade levels as far as folks working as a team and us directing them on how to work as a team these people are professionals most of them know what that means and so most of them are already doing that 
the guidance that came from um, central office from my office is around making sure that what students have access to is consistent outwardly facing how they work together they can determine on their own because they know their own schedules they know what works for them and that's what they're doing now julie i also i have a dog that's barking so i might have to mute myself they've been pretty cooperative but at any moment one of the three may go um, we also have an extended oh. learning uh, support for staff uh, page that only staff can actually log into um, it's not available for the public and um, we have a new document actually that's going for um, K to five teachers from the coordinators, which actually is set up as a Google slideshow. And it actually shows teachers, these are some things you can use. There, these are some resources we've approved of, and it's all in one place. Our goal is to have the extended learning um, support for staff page be that um, hub of where all of those resources are for teachers. So they aren't doing kind of that I saw this, I saw that. The coordinators are actually very involved behind the scenes as well with getting us um, seats for things um, or expanding our licenses uh, because there's so many of them are free right now. And then they push that message out to staff as well to make sure that, that teachers know that we now have dream boxes now available for everyone and not just for kids that are getting um, particular uh, supports. So um, we do have a hub that that's, um, and the page is there right now. It does have things on it for staff. And then we have this new um, K-5 document that is going to be posted as well. For the middle school, all of the coordinators have actually set up, um, I could kind of leave these, these particular folders, but they're not just folders. They're actually lessons. They're um, the, their um, materials, their resources. And then they, the coordinators meet weekly with the, um, middle school staff as the staff are available. Not all staff can make those meetings and um, they share what are those practices that are working right now. There's a lot of collaboration that's happening through Google Meet. And, uh, but again, we do have staff that are, have their own struggles right now. So it's not an expectation that everybody can attend those meetings. But I do want you to know that you don't have to go to a million meetings. There, there is a web page. There's also those meetings with the coordinators and then principals uh, and the school-based me meetings as well. I was actually trying to share that, but I don't have the capacity to share on my um, screen so that so that you can see what that um, staff hub looks like. So, uh, can I speak, Barbara? Um, so, I'd like to follow up on two things. One, what uh, Julie was saying and what Nicole was saying about what the kindergarten teachers are doing. I think we should. Uh, if it hasn't happened already, I think every grade level should have that uh, ability to have those Google, uh, especially the K through five. It sounds like six through 12 has worked it out in very good fashion, but the, for the K through five to have that. So, you know, it's great to have a lot of resources, but then you can get overwhelmed. But if you can look at individual, you know, a lesson plan or something that worked particularly well for a teacher, you can emulate it. It's easy. You know, it, it doesn't take as much time and effort as going through just reams of, of stuff. I'm sure, and maybe this is happening. I don't, I don't want to assume it's not. Um, the other thing that I was thinking about with the teachers who can't participate on those calls from the curriculum coordinators, why not, you know, do we're doing asynchronous teaching with children. Why not do it for staff too, where they can, you know, it can be are recorded and they can watch it when they're available later on at night or whatever when they have time so those are just that's things. that's exactly what um we do have on this site there are modules that teach folks how to get up and running on google classrooms how to do screen casting how to record videos and post them mm -hmm. um, all of those items are here this WebEx, for whatever reason won't let me share a screen it will only let me share a file so i can't uh, sure. No, I, I appreciate Then that's great. But yeah. I do think the piece of, we used to years ago have like second grade, you know, when we still had first class, we had, you know, second grade teachers in a conference and first grade teachers all across the district in a conference. I, I don't know if we still have that or not. We do. We still have that. Oh, 
okay. the kindergarten teachers have their own right. PSP conference. They all can um, contribute. We have those for every grade level. Oh, okay, excellent. The next step is hopefully they're using it too in the same way as the kindergarten teachers. So Barbara, you're on mute. We can't hear you. Um, it's 428 right now, and I think that um, we need to move this conversation along a bit. Um, so we would like to have this um, task force and we need to figure out exactly who is going to be on it. I'm thinking about categories now. And I was sitting here um, writing things down. Can I, before you go through that, can I just say one thought yeah. about this? It's great to have a huge amount of participants. On the other hand, you have a short period of time that you want to get a lot done. I would stick with the people we have with the two school committee members who volunteered and our staff working together and bringing in those groups when they need to be brought in. They know who they are. They know how to contact them and also those groups can contact them without them reaching out. I mean, it can go both ways. So that would be my suggestion. Ellen, are you thinking no parents, no teachers, no VEU? I think, I, yeah, I think it, it's the two working, the two people from our committee working with the staff, try it for a week, see how it moves forward. You know, I mean, we're working sort of, we want, we want things to be done quickly. If you try and get a group together, it's going to take two weeks just to get the group together. And how do you pick which parents? How do you pick which teachers? You know, it's sort of, that's my opinion, but I'm not on the task force. So I, that's my two cents. I'm done. Right. But who are the, te who are the people from the school committee that you're talking about? I guess I was just assuming Sharon and Susan, but I may be wrong. I don't, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I'd be happy to be on it as well. That's fine. I mean, I think, you know, we all bring different perspectives to it and I think that would be good. But I think when you open it up, I mean, it just, you just enter, you know, it just will take too long for anything to really happen. And if you great. prefer to have just the two of you, that would be fine with me too. Helen, I understand your concern about having a group that's too large and I agree we wouldn't want it too large. But I feel that our uh, family is such an important constituency that to not have at least one person to well, represent no, them, even if it's only one. There are people here who have families and have kids in the schools. I mean, it's not like they're, you know, like me who don't, I'm not experiencing it firsthand, you know? And I think they can call on people to, to find out how things are going. They can put out maybe something on Facebook, letting people know you know, what's happening. There, there are ways to communicate without having everybody in a chat together. And I think that's going to just take up an inordinate amount of time and not move. I mean, we have to think about what the goal is here. The goal is to get things done as quickly as possible. If you start. I, um, yeah? so I, I, I'm, I'm fine with a large group or a small group. I like the idea of a small group. I would actually like to try to uh, Hold Jennifer Monopoly into this if possible, because she's actually doing this in a different town and so may have some experiences that we can bring to bear. And also it was incredibly, incredibly helpful during our negotiations with the BEU, um, specifically around how this was all gonna work. So I can see your smile, um, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm going to just please, please, please ask you to, to join us in this, please, please. So happy, I, I can't wait to be on another committee smile. Yeah. <laughs> Jennifer, can you share with us what your what a weekly plan looks like for you? I'm sorry, tell me again. Can you share what your weekly plan looks like or daily plan or whatever you put out to your families? Um, right now, like you want to hear what it looks like. For What's your week? What no, like, do you, do you have it? written down? Is there like a calendar or something? Uh, there's an extensive document that has been supplied by my district with 
So you're doing what you're doing what your district has directed you to do. Of course I am. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, some of the things I was doing before the plan came out, you know, um, um, there's expectations for face-to-face um, -face class meetings. Um, there's expectations of um, recorded videos of teachers and, 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 or other supplied in, recorded instructional material. It does not necessarily always have to be the classroom teacher. Um, you know, so there's a, there's just a whole set of guidelines of expectations that educators have. Um, you know, and I think it looks different. We're hearing it looks different in different districts, and I just think that um, I think people need to understand like what are what are the minimum expectations that I can expect to hear from my from the educators um, that are working with my my children, and I think it's also good to have sort of like here's where we think we can land each grade level by the end of the year when we know that we're just if Desi, if, if Commissioner Riley is advocating three hours a day, we're clear, and that's say, I think the recommendations were like half the amount of time per subject. So if I remember reading it correctly, or maybe I put this in my head, 30 minutes of reading instead of 60 or 30 minutes of math instead of 60 per day, um, we're not gonna be able to, that's half as much curriculum that you're gonna get through and you're gonna have to do it in a different way. So every day, you know, um, working and we're having to rethink the, the delivery of instruction and what that looks like and, and what we can do. Um, and I really, really thank you so much for Dr. Abramowitz for, for, for pulling me into this um, and suggesting that um, I volunteer for this. I, but I'm really, I have to be honest, I'm really struggling with balance right now. I just, I cannot have them another committee right now. I just, I am reinventing my work and my heart is in that and it's and it's and it's all day it's all night families are reaching out at different times it's kids need different things um recording read alouds it takes me seven takes I, I don't like the way my first one came out um and then we have interim superintendent committee coming up this week and I just, I honestly, I just feel like I'm at my max capacity right now, balancing all the things in my world. And I know that this is important work and I support it. And I just don't know that I can commit to always being there. I, I'm sorry, universe, but I, I have to like call time on something in my, my life. I, we all want to have, and I think a lot of anxiety families are feeling, and I get it is that we that things are feel a little out of control for in the universe right and so we need to know what we can what we can expect and i get that um so yes say no i'm sorry i'm going on and on because I, I this is oh, it's okay i'm not doing that i'm not saying that you know i i i feel for you, you it's know? my it's my I, guilt I, I think you just have to say no i cannot do this i can't I, as much as i would like to i cannot and that's okay it's really okay Susan, are you a thank you? Thank you very much. I'm happy to join meetings. I just don't want to commit to always being on the committee. I'm happy to join and like offer my voice. It's just a commitment feels emotionally different to me than like attending a meeting. So I hope I'm sure that Dr. Bromowitz and um and Susan would be I, I I nominate you to be our representatives if you solely if you choose to accept this task. Um I feel like this is one of those Facebook challenges where it's like, you know, <laughs> I nominate you. No, I nominate you. So I think that that's and and Barbara, I heard you voice willingness as well. And we Julie, I am of mixed minds. I'd be perfectly happy not being on it. I think that it's what are next steps? Yeah, there is room. So there are room. There is room for there is room for three. And so if the three of you are interested, then I think you have three very, very different voices. And I think that there are three important voices. And I think that Ms. Mopoli can be invited. And as she's able to participate in meetings, that her voice is also very important in this conversation. And so, but if that's, so I'm going to go ahead. I, I as, as chair of school committee will officially ask the three of you. And Barbara is, I guess. Susan? Yes, I heard, I saw another. Yes, and Sharon. 
Okay, and then I'd like Ben or Nicole, I think that it's important to have your voice on who you think it's most appropriate to have represented from the district and how many people you think that that is. And, I, and I'm very aware of meeting fatigue and overload fatigue. And so I want to make sure that you can have the right voices at the table so that you have representation of where you, you know, of the appropriate places without pulling too many people away. And so I'd like to hear your thoughts on who from the district you think would be best. And you don't have to tell me, you know, Susie or Jen or whoever those exact people are, but categories of people and how many uh, you think would be the right fit. We definitely need coordinators to be a part of this. And I, I, I'm not sure which ones or how many, um, probably at least three. Um, I think we should have Jess at the table as well. Um, so I think the, the BEU voice is really important to what will actually get accomplished. Principles. Definitely principles. I would just like to note, we have a question from the public from CPAC co-chair Linda Monac asking whether there are educators in other districts who could bring the type of expertise that we were envisioning for uh, Jennifer in this group. And uh, I would echo Ms. Monac's sentiment and think this could also be a way that we could involve one community parent. There's a community parent who's a teacher in another district. I think that could be very helpful. So I, let's have the, so in this next category of people, let's talk about parents. And so our, what do we, we've heard, I've heard a couple people have spoken on whether they think parents. I know that David and I were both in support of it. I heard someone who I'm now forgetting who thought that maybe it was too big, Helen, too big so, and too much. Just what do we think? I guess Susan. So I have a, yeah, no, I have a thought on parents, which is that I think that there are a number of parents that, um, at least I am hearing from on a very regular basis and I feel perfectly comfortable um, representing those voices. I think there are probably a group that Sharon is hearing from as well. There are groups of parents that we are not hearing from structurally. We are not hearing from steps to success parents. We are not hearing from Metco parents. We are not hearing structurally from um, CPAC parents and we're not hearing from English learner parents. And so I would suggest that to the extent that we are um, looking for parents, that we look for parents who are not people that we are already hearing from. So that's number one. Number two, I do think that some combination of police, Mindy, Malcolm, I'm not quite sure who, I think we really need to think about who um, should be invited to this, because I think that having those people at the table from the beginning is a very different thing from, oh, well, we'll just ask you if we want to Sort of halfway through so i don't i understand the scheduling challenges please please believe me i i understand that but i think that if we were to have some sort of standing meeting that people could predict um then i i don't i'm not excited to structurally exclude um groups of people who probably are need need this more than than others um so i i i, I think we need to make yep. sure that there are structure you know we already have a we do have a solid group of parents who've been involved in the um, math program review and they are representative of every grade level, every constituency in the district. So maybe we can pull on those folks to see if they'd be interested to to further um, be engaged with this work. Yeah, because I, I also think a that really good job to... picking those folks to be a part of that. And they were really um, people who are thinking beyond me, 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 my, 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 but really thinking about the, the whole community. It just seems to me that if we can have a standing meeting and if there are people that can't attend that, then a couple of us who have a little more time, I'm not sure who that is, um, can sort of make sure that, you know, there's, I don't know, a second check-in or something, but I just, I, I structurally, I want to make sure that we're doing this right. So I, I appreciate that as sort of a, almost a test group, you know, almost a, a focus group um, as well. Um, almost we're going to invite them all. Um, so can I, um, can I, can I pitch in here and suggest that we ask all of the school site councils to identify just one liaison to this task force and then within schools, people can bring their concerns to the site council liaison who can then bring it forward to us. It kind of like disaggregates things by school rather than by other kinds of, of networks. 
Yeah, just just sort of a friendly amendment to that. Sometimes um, site council is more active. Sometimes PTO is more active. It really depends on the group. And so I would maybe I think I like the idea of one per school and it would be great if it was site council. But I also just happen to know that there are a number of site councils that are not quite. All the way kind of there and so and there and the PTOs are, are much more active. So at any rate, it's something we could talk about. But I do think that there's something I think there's something important about having them um, invited. That's a big jump, though. We just went from, but we, we, but we, we, we took a big jump on diff numbers all of a sudden. And so, and I also think that if we are going one representative per school that's recommended by the PTO, we don't necessarily cover those other four groups that we've identified as priority groups. And so, if we're, we either try to then, I, I just think we all of a sudden made a huge jump to this being a working group very task oriented, working fast to adding nine people in addition to all of the other people. And I, I think we might, it might have tipped over to too many. I'm sorry, I, my I understanding. Oh. I was just going to say that uh, my understanding was that this would be more of a focus group, that there would be one individual from each school reporting to our school committee members who are on the task force. So they're not directly involved in every meeting. It's more a reporting mechanism that's efficient and designed to make sure that we are receiving feedback from each school. So think so of like it more as a, so think of it more as sort of what we have for liaison arrangements. But uh, so. as long as as long as we weren't adding nine more people to attend these meetings, I am all on board with that. Great. I see a lot exactly. of exactly. Exactly. Right. So maybe we'll, the other thing that I would suggest is that if we can find a stand, if we if we pick some, I mean, I think there, there's like a, a, we don't need to do it on this call, but if this is more or less the group that people feel comfortable with, um, I think there's just some value to having sort of taking it offline and trying to get some of these slots filled and find a standing weekly time or twice a week time or three times a week time, um, whatever we need in order to just because otherwise we, we're not going to be able to go meeting by meeting. I think we're going to have to just find a time, uh, but. But I think that's very doable. I just want to reiterate one more time that I think it's critically important. I think that some of you are already saying this anyway, that we have at least one parent who's directly on the task force for interests of transparency and credibility. I know that we that about half of our school committee members are current uh, K through 12 parents, but very often as school committee members, we might be wearing our school committee hat a bit more. And even though I trust those of you who will be on it, I think the community will have greater buy-in if there's a parent who's not on the inside who can directly be reporting out. Yeah, one parent makes more sense. Makes, it seems like a, an acceptable compromise position. Yeah. That, that's fine. I just want to make sure that we are somehow getting coverage of these other areas that we're not hearing as much yeah. from. That's all. So, one thing that I would, you know, when you went through, Nicole, all the different people who you think are important, it seems to me the, you know, people from STEPS who are working in the system, Malcolm, Jeanette, Malcolm, and Mindy would be important people to have working as staff in this group. Okay. I also think it's important to have Jess as a member, and then we can, we, someone yes. from the, the working group or the, or someone else, I'm happy to reach out. But if there, if she feels, and there are other teachers or educators who would like to participate, I think that it is would be great to have teacher additional teacher voice on the group. And so, you know, I would like for to have give or have the leeway to have more spots or more involvement if that's something that they're wanting to participate in further. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. If we're going to have a lot of you know administrators and curriculum coordinators and principals, that we should some educators in that group because they're doing different levels of that work. Um, and so I think that's important for us to have. Yeah, just to that point, it's a really good point. And I wonder if, um, you know, if the BU would be willing to put in somebody who is an active teacher, um, not that Jess isn't great, but just there are people on their executive committee that are actively in the buildings teaching right now. Not in, no one's in the buildings. People who are actively um, teaching and they might just have a, a perspective. So it may be worth just having that conversation with her and, and asking her about that, um, asking their executive committee. Yes, agreed. That's, that sounds like a really good idea. Okay, so it sounds, and then 
Um, do you think that this is offline conversation to talk about timeline? And I, I think so as well. Okay, great. So is there anything, or I'm sorry to be taking over, Barbara, is there anything else you were wanting to cover? Uh, no, I think not. I Did we have, Robin, did we have minutes that we... Yes, you do. You have a set of March 3rd minutes that were distributed to the subcommittee. Can I just be clear? So school committee members will talk offline to organize this and next steps. Is that right? Great. Okay, thank you. I saw Susan nodding, so I'll take that. Sorry, Barbara. Thank you. That's all right. Did the people on the committee read the minutes? Helen? I'm looking yeah. sheepish. <laughs> no. No, I can I haven't had time to, to, to look at them. I'm sorry. Next meeting, they'll hold. Thank you. I'll make sure to do my homework. All right. I'm sure they're brilliant. I'm sure. Robin is excellent. So I could almost do it without reading it. Yes, we all could, but we can't. So right. anyway. Uh, before um, we leave, I just want to make sure uh, that CPAC is also going to be on the task force. I would nominate Linda Monarch. Absolutely. Sorry, Linda. Yeah, no, no, that was, those were the four, there were four groups. There was Steps of Success, Special Education, English Learners, and Metco. Those were, those were the four, at least that I perceive as not having quite as much, as having special groups of, um, special sets of considerations um, for those populations. What were the four groups again? So CPAC, English Learners, Metco, Steps. Steps. All right. Anybody have anything else they want to contribute? Or shall we all go back to our leisurely lives? Yes. <laughs> I'm happy to say something nice. leisurely life your way, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I wish I could invite you into my leisurely life. Um, <laughs>